I do pray. And still, in spite of God, I believe in God. Because to say, okay, Mr. God, you didn't want it, hell with you. I could have said that, and no one would have had the right to object. I could have said, Mr. God, look, all my life, my young life, I gave to you. You don't save your own people, I don't want you. Goodbye. I didn't. Maybe it was because I didn't want to bring shame to my grandfather and his and his and his and his. I come from a long line. I didn't want to be the first to say, to divorce God. That was the reason. For no theological uh, arguments could, could prevail. Simply a matter of, of fidelity that I felt. I was going to die maybe next day. I came back, believe it or not, I don't even believe it to myself. I became, I re-became really more religious than I was before. I didn't even think about anything else. All I thought was, almost, not the same words, I'll show you. <laughs> Just, I'll show you. You don't want me to believe in you, I will believe. <laughs> Writers have only one obsession, use words. But about this, I have reasons to question my own judgment. I'm not sure that I have found the right words. On one level, I would say that if I had found the right words, the world would be a different world. And since the world hasn't changed, maybe it's my fault, because my warning was not heard, because my testament was not received. Even if I was never involved in this, and I had only read the periodic table, you know, these are, these are books that are civilizing books that open you up, and that if you are a, a prejudiced you know, person, and everyone has prejudice in them. It's a way of confronting that within yourself. Mm -hmm. And that is a major contribution and to we, the world. We should remember I mean, that. Eli says, he says, you know, he didn't find the right words, but it's also the person who has to receive those words. Adams is a Puritan. And um, the, uh, the, the Puritan ethic is essentially that man cannot contain his own darkest impulses, that there has to be a governor, and whether that governor is providence or a strong executive branch or a strong legislative branch, there is something outside of us, okay, that allows that war in our own personalities, okay, to lead to our better selves. But there has to be some external force applied, which is what he says here at the end of the episode. Most men are weak and cynical and sadistic. <laughs> you know, he's not wrong. Uh, but um, but that, was, that was his belief, and it was very much formed by that whole Puritan ideal. Are we supposed to understand that judges can remove themselves from the passions of the people outside the courthouse? Now, you, you unlike what happened in the Boston Massacre, again, very different case, I mean, you really <laughs> threw the book at Madoff. How do, you, how do you judge when you know the world is watching? Yeah, well, it was, it was a lot of pressure. I felt a lot of pressure. Um, and here, I didn't struggle so much with, with the number, um, but I, I certainly struggled with how to impose it, what do I say. But the defense lawyer argued that, 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 that I shouldn't succumb to mob uh, vengeance. And um, just because there were a lot of people saying the same thing did not mean that this was a mob. The difference between Morrow and today is that in Morrow's day, it was the journalism that counted, and today it's the performance. Mm. Morrow was the best performer ever. Mm. I mean, you could not take your eyes off of his eyes. It was magnetic. Morrow was a celebrity, but he shunned that for a long time. He, he thought the truest way to, to impart uh, information was audibly and not visually, mm -hmm. because as soon as you throw a visual image, we relate to it, we, 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 we analyze it, we react to it differently. 
truth doesn't seem to matter anymore. That the candidates can say anything they want, and even worse, there was no one with the stature of a Cronkite, of a Murrow, of a whomever, to be able to hold the candidates accountable and say, you lied. That's just not true. And no one has the credibility to do that. And that, I think, is a horrible, dangerous situation. Listen, I think people are fascinated by transgressors. People are fascinated by doing things that they would never dream of doing. And so everybody loves Al Capone. You know, what, what a great character. Everybody loves all the gangsters and all the guys in Boardwalk Empire, even though they're fictional. But what's left out is the despicableness. These people tend to get romanticized. So what you're left with is this, um, you take the biggest psychopath and over time he becomes Robin Hood. When I was growing up, the way if you were Jewish, and I didn't grow up in an especially Jewish place, but if you were Jewish, you were expected to live a certain kind of life, and, and the idea was if you were a criminal, you were going to be a white-collar criminal. And you can never escape this sort of Jewish stereotype, no matter what the world was. And I think that it's just a sort of a fantasy when you have to follow rules your entire life to see a group of people that don't follow. Most cops hate this whole concept of war, the war on drugs. I mean, you know, that's like the oldest thing in the world. You know, they used to say, uh, the war on, drug is o war on drugs is over the minute the drugs come into the country. And one uh, narcotics guy said to me, well, you know, fighting the war on drugs is like sweeping leaves on a windy day. Those deeper truths that you get that are, com that are difficult to deliver, they're much deeper. Because in fact, you want to make a movie about a prison system. Dostoevsky said you can judge any country by the quality of its prisons. So any society by the quality of its prisons. Well, the reality is when someone tells you that prison was the best thing that ever happened to them, that is a far deeper critique of a society than isn't prison bad. What's most heartrending is the inability, I think it's in four families of the older generation to be able to prevent the younger generation. Right from getting into terrible troubles, right. too. That is the single most heart-wrenching thing I've seen in movies in a long time. If I don't make a dent in this world, then all I do is I'm a merchant of despair. I'm a profiteer in the same system that the guy with the stun gun is. I'm just the guy who packages it in a story for our strange white liberal edification. And so I wanted to make a dent, and I, I made choices in places that I felt were about covering mandatory minimums or making sure that crack argument was made. And yeah. I never knew if I was right or wrong, but that's what I was wrestling with. The original correct version is he went to a country club in, uh, in Hollywood, and he, had, and he had his daughter with him and some friends, and he was going to go swimming. And as he indicated he was going to, um, a flunky came over and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Marks, but we, uh, we don't allow Jewish people in the pool. And Groucho said, really? You know, my daughter is only half Jewish. Can she go in up to her knees? <laughs> I mean, isn't that a lot better than getting mad and storming out? <laughs> Zeppo left them at this transition, didn't he? When they went to MGM, there was no more Zeppo. And Thalberg had the nerve to say he was going to pay them less because there weren't as many Marx Brothers. <laughs> And there are two versions of what Groucho said. My favorite is that that's absurd. You know, without Groucho, we're worth, or without Zeppo, we're worth more money. But the best version is, <laughs> is that you, you can't do that. We're, we're uh, you know, the four Marx Brothers were a million dollar act. And without Zeppo, two million. <laughs>